Tensions rise again in the South China Sea. The Philippines is caught between two Pacific superpowers. In April, the country welcomed a top Chinese envoy, but also posted their largest ever joint military drill with the United States. So can Manila continue to manage a delicate balance? And are Filipinos comfortable stuck in the middle? I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. The U.S. has committed to defending the Philippines. It comes as Manila faces increased Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea. Beijing claims the entire expanse of water as its own, including around islands the Philippines claim sovereignty over. It led to a tense standoff last month when the Chinese and Philippines Coast Guards nearly collided. In the face of the friendly relationship between China and the Philippines, we hope you can cooperate with our deeds. Do not take inappropriate behaviors which will interfere with maritime security. Well, that passive-aggressive exchange comes after a January agreement between President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and counterpart Xi Jinping, in which they promised to handle maritime issues through friendly consultations. But at the heart of the issue is actually Taiwan. China's claims over the self-governing island are growing louder, even as the U.S. commitment to defend it appears to be deepening. The Philippines quite literally sits in the middle and is now trying to manage relations within a global power struggle. Last week, the Philippines president set off on a four-day visit to Washington. It was the first presidential visit to the U.S. by a Filipino president in a decade. The two countries agreed on new guidelines for their 1951 mutual defense treaty, following multiple requests by Manila to clarify the conditions under which Washington would come to its defense. President Biden has made clear our commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. And let me say once again that our mutual defense treaty applies to armed attacks on our armed forces, Coast Guard vessels, public vessels, or aircraft in the Pacific, including anywhere in the South China Sea. So make no mistake, Mr. President, we will always have your back in the South China Sea or elsewhere in the region. Well, despite that update to the country's nearly 72-year defense alliance, Marcos did not respond directly to one crucial question. Can the U.S. station weapons at the four new military bases Washington now has access to should China attack Taiwan? Now there's an additional, uh, there's an additional uh, aspect to it. And that is, whilst the tensions across, in the, across, Taiwan, across the Taiwan Straits uh, seem to be continuing to increase, then the safety of our Filipino nationals in Taiwan becomes of primordial importance. And so that uh, these EDCA sites will also prove to be useful for us uh, should that uh, terrible occurrence uh, come about. Well, this all played out against the backdrop of more than 12 thousand U.S. troops joining some 5,000 Filipino soldiers in April, taking part in the largest joint military exercises to date. They included the first ever live fire exercise in the South China Sea, an event Beijing labeled an attempt to target China. Beijing says Manila is stoking the fire over Taiwan's independence by giving the U.S. access to these military sites. The Mutual Defense Treaty is a bilateral treaty between the United States and the Philippines. China firmly opposes any country's interference in the South China Sea issue under the pretext of bilateral treaties, which will damage China's territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests. What I want to stress is that the South China Sea is home to all regional countries and should not become a hunting ground for external forces home to all regional countries, but with what borders? And where does that lack of clarity leave the Philippines? Joining me now to debate that and more are from Beijing, political and economic affairs analyst, Einar Tengen. From Manila, Jay Batong Bakal, a former government legal advisor on maritime issues and also an associate law professor at the University of the Philippines. And from Washington, Robert Manning, a distinguished senior fellow with the Stimson Center's Reimagining U.S. Grand Strategy Project. Thanks all so much for being with me. Jay, let me start with you in Manila. 
and uh, mm -hmm. give us a more personal idea of how Filipinos see especially this relationship with the United States and where it leaves the Philippines now in relation to China? Well, I think that uh, consistently over the past uh, few years, no, public opinion has always been in favor of the United States. And even under the Duterte administration, six years of that, with the government trying to bring us closer to China, public opinion has always uh, gone the other way and uh, preferred closer relations with the U.S. So I think these recent uh, developments are actually um, garnering much a greater public support uh, mm. in favor of the current administration. Are Filipinos scared at all, though, to be in the middle of this? Well, there are, of course, some quarters that are sort of raising alarms, but I think overall the Filipino population really is... Uh, still uh, placing very much confidence uh, in the administration and the alliance. So I don't think they're really th that concerned yet with what has been going on in the region. Einar, let me ask you how disappointed or maybe frustrated the Chinese might feel given this shift from Duterte's more pro-China policy to what we're seeing now in the first visit to the United States in 10 years of a Philippines president. Well, obviously, uh, Beijing doesn't like it, um, but uh, it was uh, fairly predictable. Uh, there have been some skirmishes going back and forth. Uh, the latest one looks a little suspicious, happening just before uh, he, uh, Feng Wang was going to Washington. But apart from that, there's been more than a half a dozen uh, issues uh, that have gone along. And as you say, it's a populist card. You can always play the anti-China card, and it's uh, very well received uh, within um, the Philippines. So uh, this is something that, uh, it, you know, Beijing is weighing. Uh, the good side of it was that um, he was very clear that he does not uh, want uh, the Philippines to be a staging ground for any kind of attack uh, or any in war that does not have a direct um, connection to the Philippines itself. Mm. Uh, very quickly, Jay, was he clear? Do you think you agree? Yes, I think it's been very clear on that uh, with that message from the very beginning. That's why I think the people who are opposing these relations haven't really been getting much traction. Uh, after all, the mutual defense uh, treaty is all about defense. And the president from the very beginning made it clear that it would not be for any kind of offensive uh, action. Okay. Then, Robert, let me ask you, do you think the Philippines can... Uh in a sense, have it both ways. We talk about maintaining this kind of delicate balance. I mean, is that really possible given the geopolitical tension in, in the South China Sea? Well, it's it's problematic, but I mean, that's a, that's a situation where all of uh, East Asia faces, whether it's Singapore or Thailand, uh, they're, they're caught between these two uh, warring superpowers and it, that are sort of trapped in a kind of death spiral of tit-for-tat uh, action reactions. And uh, there, at the same time, you know, all of Asia, China is, is its largest trading partner and a major investor. And the U.S., is, you know, however much they want to align with the U.S., there's a factor of geography, which is they, China's next door to them and the U.S. is 7,000 miles away. So there's always going to be a certain amount of hedging. Uh, and I think the Philippines is, is, is doing that. I think by providing uh, a new access to, to four or five new bases, uh, they're trying to, the U.S. is, is uh, strengthening its posture in, in the South China Sea and East Asia uh, to, to counterbalance China. And and, uh, okay. and I think there's an effort, yeah. I, I, gotta, I gotta pick up on though, you, you're calling it a, a death spiral. I mean, where does that death spiral actually culminate? Well, that's what everybody's afraid of mm. because, you know, if you listen to the debate in Washington, sometimes I wonder if people in Congress understand that China is a nuclear weapon state. Uh, and uh, and that, you know, we've sort of forgotten all the lessons of the Cold War uh, that, you know, after the, maybe it'll take another Cuban crisis type situation to sober up both sides. But I think, uh, and, there, you know, the Biden administration is trying to, to put a kind of a floor under the relationship. 
it was just a meeting, to, the first meeting we've had of uh, our U.S. Ambassador Nick Burns with the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Uh, so I think the Chi there's an effort by both governments to try to stabilize the relationship. The problem is in both countries, you have a kind of surging uh, angry nationalism that is mm. in the China anti-U.S. and in the U.S. anti-China. Interesting. Jay, I can see you agree. Einar, let me come back to you, though, and if you don't mind, I'd like to pick up on what you were calling the suspicious uh, interchange. Um, in fact, I think you said it was staged at one point. In the intro, we played that exchange between the Filipino and Chinese uh, sea vessels, and I described it as this kind of passive-aggressive exchange, but doesn't it fall actually under the requirement now for those friendly consultations regarding maritime issues? Yeah, that, that's the agreement where, uh, with ASEAN uh, nations uh, that it has to be talked out, not fought out, uh, and, and that's that's the way it has to be. Uh, unless you know you want uh, another repeat of what's happened in other places like uh, the Middle East and the stands in Africa and in South America. Um, I, I completely agree with Robert. There, this is uh, looking more and more like a death spiral, uh, despite the attempts to open communications. Um, China is taking a slightly different tact. Uh, they're they're no longer just going to sit there and see what the U.S. does in a kind of grand game of go. Uh, they are now stating what they think is necessary for the relationship. They really believe that, although Biden says he's um, creating a floor, that he's actually just trying to see how far he can push uh, China before it, you know, something cracks. And that's mm. that's a real danger. Uh, and, and that and you know, obviously, um, you know, China is trying to figure out exactly how this is all going to work. They know the U.S. Mm -hmm. wants to contain uh, them, but uh, the question is how far. Uh, I know, just a detail, though, I'm, I'm curious, when, when you described it at one point as a staged interchange, what, to what end? Why would that be staged or set up? Well, uh, you know, as, as you said, it was passive aggressive. It's kind of an odd thing happening just before. It doesn't make sense for uh, China to be pushing these kind of buttons because that would uh, clearly put the public opinion on uh, you know the side of the Philippines, so you know you're kind of wondering why a small vessel is kind of going up to a large vessel and things like that. It's loaded mm -hmm. with uh, the the press. Um, you know, it's a little suspicious. I'm not saying that I have any proof or anything like that. I just said you know the timing and the fact that there are a whole a skew load of uh, of journalists on this uh, on this ship just sounds a little odd. Jay, was it a setup? No, it wasn't a setup. In fact, these kinds of uh, um, exchanges and encounters have been happening on a fairly regular basis uh, every time uh, the Coast Guard uh, goes out on patrol and tries to venture to any of our outposts there. I myself was uh, in that area uh, near Pagasa Island or Tito Island back in October 2021, and we were challenged by a China Coast Guard vessel uh, with these kinds of messages as well. No. Uh, the only thing different, I think, about these messages is that uh, they've they've been changing. No? Um, they became even more um, aggressive, shall we say, or, or alarming, uh, especially in the past year. So uh, it's not that it's staged. It's, it's actually showing what regularly truly happens there every time. Hmm. Uh, the previous government simply cooperated and uh, accommodated China's request to keep things under the you know, under wraps for all those times. But the current government has taken a different uh, policy, uh, made a different policy on this. And that's why they've engaged in this so-called uh, transparency policy now on what is going on in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea. Okay. Robert, uh, if you want to, okay, Einar, go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Well, before we get into this kind of minutia, let, let's just back up a second and, and think about this. All right. Uh, the U.S. is always saying that China is somehow going to disrupt, uh, you know, the South China Seas and, you know, prevent, uh, you know, uh, cargo and everything like that from going through it. Now, you know, China's oil comes f through that area. I, you know, it's just absurd to think that China is going to cut off, uh, literally commit suicide for, for what end? I mean, this is not going to hurt the United States, um, mm. and, and certainly uh, it's not does not want to hurt its largest trade partner now, which was uh, is ASEAN. So, if you just back up a little bit and understand that this is much ado about nothing, except for this territorial issue, and that unfortunately starts uh, bringing in a lot of nationalist fever from all sides. Right. Okay, Robert, go ahead. 
yeah, I think, you know, from the Chi the way the Chinese see what they're doing, it's not just the Philippines. They have disrupted, for example, oil and gas exploration. The Malaysians have done in their special economic zone, uh, what Vietnam has done. And even uh, Indonesia, and the, the Natuna Islands, which are fall within the Indonesian 200-mile economic zone. As for the, the, what the Chinese, the Chinese have uh, uh, full claims that uh, that they can that they to about 85 percent of the South China Sea. The Philippines uh, took them to court at the International Court of The Hague in 2016. The Hague ruled that the China had no such claim. So this their act, what they see themselves doing is enforcing their sovereignty claims, which are all false. And I think the region and the U.S. need to under, underscore the international illegality of it, be, because this is this is the Chinese uh, trying to compensate for two and two centuries of humiliation by asserting themselves, destabilizing uh, the, the the region. I know. I mean, I, I know you so, have argued before, and I think we have a map, so we we might just get that up so our viewers can better understand what, what we're talking about here. Because geographically, and just quickly, Einar, I mean, we look at the the Spratly I Islands. They are extremely close in their proximity to Philippine shores, uh, as as is Vietnamese shores are even closer. While China is multiple times farther away, I know you say there are historical claims, Einar, but international law has consistently said. Uh, that those historical claims aren't recognized, and just look at the map. Uh, absolutely, and it's uh, it all right. goes back to when uh, the national the Republic of China was uh, founded by Sun Yat-sen. Not this was not something that was uh, created by the current government. Um, it was it was done back in 1912. No one paid any attention to it. Kind of like the Monroe Doctrine that the U.S. Uh, had in place for those many years and asserted, uh, uh, you know, it's. You know, basically power over. But remember, you know, I always love it when people say ch uh, China. Well, you also have to remember Taiwan has exactly the same claims and asserts the same uh, territorial uh, waters. And between all of these countries, they all have cross, uh, you know, claims against each other. The problem was the United States started off with this uh, un uh, enlarging its territorial waters, and this set off a furor that ended in unclose. But it's never really been very well settled. Now, there, there was a ruling. Uh, I, I'm the first one to say that this uh, 11, it was originally 11 dash line, um, is a little suspect because if you look at the map, there's nothing on there that really indicates what that nine, da that, sorry, 11 dash line actually means. Mm -hmm. um, from China's perspective, they say it's historical. That is their claim. The question is where can this be best uh, settled? Should it be settled uh, amongst the countries of uh, that border, this sea, or from outside interests? Okay, let, trying... let me ask Jay oh. then how, how it should be settled. You are the maritime legal expert. Well, uh, first we have to make distinctions. Now. The territorial claims over the islands themselves, uh, those are actually fairly recent. The, it was the Taiwanese who actually first, first published that map the 11 dash uh, line map that was mentioned in 1947. And the thing was that uh, from that time on until 2009, it wasn't clear whether the waters inside the nine dash line map, meaning outside of those islands, were also being claimed by them. But from 2009, uh, China became increasingly assertive. And eventually, from their actions, it appeared that they were claiming absolute sovereignty over the entire area of the nine dash line. And that's where the problem arises for the rest of Southeast Asia because it denies them waters to which they're entitled to under international law, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this was an agreement that China itself participated in uh, in the 70s. In fact, China sided with the uh, Southeast Asian nations in the idea of creating an exclusive economic zone, for example, or, and the expansion of the continental shelf. This was all negotiated. Uh, and now it's, it's basically turning its back on that agreement and, mm. and telling the smaller Southeast Asian nations that, no, you don't have them when it comes to the South China Sea because that's ours. So because of that, uh, you know, that adds to these uh, uh, problems. Now, how they should be resolved, as far as the Philippines is concerned, the territorial claims over the islands themselves, they're still pending because that was not resolved in the arbitration case. But insofar as the waters around them, the maritime zones under UNCLOS, 
that has already been uh, resolved by the tribunal, and we are entitled to our full 200-mile ex exclusive economic zone. And that is now what China is still mm. taking from us, no? by sending right. their fishing fleet, by doing their patrolling, etc. And uh, Robert, I mean, it doesn't look like China is going to change its mind, no matter what international rulings there might be. So now we're, we are where we are, and the U.S. is now saying that its support for the Philippines is, quote, ironclad. So what does that really mean? Well, remember, the, the Chinese have signed and ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty, and, and it's, it's, it's that law that they signed on to that they're violating. Uh, and and I, I think, if in the case of the Philippines, the tipping point really was in 2012, when a Chinese Coast Guard uh, uh, took uh, prevented the Philippines from going on to Scarborough Shoal, which is in Philippine waters, and the U.S. didn't respond to that. And I think the Chinese took that uh, as license. Mm. Uh, and ever since then, that period, they've constantly uh, stepped up their um, military inter naval intervention. They've created this mil uh, maritime militia of so-called fishing boats that are tied in electronically to the Coast Guard and the Navy and, and so on. And I, I think um, the U.S. has not been strong enough in underscoring. Uh, the U.S. always talks about a rules-based order, but we, we have not made enough of a public diplomacy issue about China's um, behavior that completely contradicts the commitments it made to the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, do you think in 2012, though, Robert, that uh, the U.S. would have foreseen, really, should they have known that the situation could have ended up like this, in this posturing well, for war? Yeah, well, number one, we, we the treaty we have with the Philippines existed in 2012. Mm. And I think I think the Obama administration, you know, they, they made a mistake. They made similar mistakes. Remember the red lines in Syria that that never got acted on. And so I think the Chinese have taken advantage of this in terms of how they perceive the situation. And I think now we're starting to see much more pushback from the United States, not just space access in, in, in the, to the Philippines, including islands that are about 70 miles from Taiwan, mm. but, but, all, but also uh, hardening Guam, negotiating more base access around the region and pushing a more of a commitment to strengthen the U.S. Uh, maritime na naval posture okay. and also, it's, yeah. I mean, let, let me just get a word in from Einar about that. I mean, do you think if the U.S. had responded differently to what happened in 2012, China might be less assertive in the South China Sea today? Yeah, I, it's a lot of speculation. Mm. All is like, I can think of is the hypocrisy. The U.S. is asserting uh, that, you know, his own close is ironclad. Well, the U.S. doesn't recognize own close, never signed on to it. And quite frankly, uh, this is not just a problem between China and the Philippines. The Philippines has uh, all sorts of uh, claims against other uh, areas of ASEAN. Uh, every single one of them has at least four claims against others and uh, China being the fifth uh, for many of them. So it, it needs to be settled as a whole. It's not just them versus China. Uh, you know, it, it's, there's gotta be some sort of clarity here. So when you talk about the problem, and I'm sure Jay can uh, add on to that, you, you have to talk about China coming forward and being creative. And I think it is um, incumbent on China to do that. Okay. Uh, they're the larger entity. They have the interest in ASEAN, so they need to do something. Okay, Jay, uh, you've, uh, just one minute. Give me your, your final thoughts then from the Philippines' perspective. Go ahead. Well, for, I think having been involved in these issues for the last five years, I think all the activity has been exhibited by the Southeast Asian nations all this time. We've been engaging in track one, uh, a formal and informal diplomacy all this time, and yet China has simply not responded uh, favorably, I think. It has actually not acted on that creativity. So I think uh, it, it's time that China recognized that, that we are living in a neighborhood and they just simply cannot impose themselves uh, on the rest of us. No? Uh, they have to also be the ones to accommodate the presence of all of us as smaller nations around them. It's not just us accommodating them. Okay.
Jay, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists really so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. And our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.